Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 1-400 scale die-cast model aircraft review of this from NG Next Generation Models, the Boeing 747-8F. We've taken a look at several 747 variants, both new and old, on the channel previously. However, what, pray tell, is particularly special about this one, and why does it look the way it does? Well, this is not simply just another 747. It's not simply just another Dash 8 747. This, my beloved audience, is the very last 747. Delivered to Atlas Air on the 31st of January 2023, this Boeing 747, line number 1574, registration November 863 Golf Tango, this is the very last 747 of any type that will ever be produced. From 1969 to 2023, the Boeing 747 has ended its production life and it has been delivered to its final customer in Atlas Air. That's it. The era of 747 production is over and it ended with this particular airframe right here, which of course is barely a year old at this point and is still very much in active service and has the better part of two decades of flying time ahead of it. However, NG, they decided to commemorate the last ever 747 with this October 2023 release in 1-400 scale. Let's take a closer look at this magnificent bird. Before we get into the ins and outs of this brand new 2023 release from our friends over at NG, let's take a look at the box from whence it comes. Coming in here from screen right at very close range and perhaps not in the best lighting, eh, camera exposure is compensating a bit. This is the box in which it comes and we are going to make a little bit of a lighting adjustment here so that we have a little bit better of a chance of seeing what we're talking about. There we are, the box. Boeing 747-8F, the last 747, line number 1574. And as we flip around our positions a little bit and zoom out and everything else so that we can maybe get a little bit of a better look at all of this stuff, there we go. The NG, Next Generation Model Box, Boeing 747-8F. Thank you, 747 team. You are incredible. And then, of course, the computer rendering of the aircraft that you see there front and center, which is ever so slightly smaller than the actual model itself. But the last 747 prominently displayed there on the box. Proudly building the 14th 747-8 freighter for Atlas Air, Atlas Air logo, and the registration on this, the last 747, November 863 Golf Tango. NG Next Generation model logo there on the bottom right, 1400 scale collectible models, die cast metal, and of course the Boeing logo there in the bottom left for your viewing pleasure. Obviously an officially licensed product of Boeing. Taking a look at the left side panel of the box, there we go, basically a condensed version of what you see on the front cover art. Boeing 7478F, thank you 747 team, etc, etc, next generation model logo there, the last 747, and then a repeat of the other graphics there, including the Atlas Air logo and trade dress stuff. You also will see the Atlas Air logo, the registration obviously, as well as this message, thank you 747 team, on the aircraft itself and uh, all of those graphics have also been faithfully reproduced in 1400 scale, which is really, really cool. Taking a look at the back side of the box here, there we go. NG Next Generation model in the upper left, and then of course it's effectively a repeat of what you have on the front panel of the box, with of course your barcode, your item number 78001 for those of you keeping score at home, and then of course your disclaimers in terms of don't eat this thing if you're under 14 years old. If you're above 14 years old, don't eat it either, but you're more liable to choke on it if you're less than 14 for some reason. Obviously we have got uh, the uh, right side panel of the box when you're looking at it from head on. Basically the same as the left side panel and then the top panel as well. Smaller rendering of the aircraft registration, the last 747, 7478F, Boeing, all of that stuff. And then the bottom of the box is effectively just a repeat of all of that, as you can see right there. So, cool. Not the best in terms of the lighting conditions. It's difficult to do. However, there you go. You can see what the box is, and uh, it does, of course, give you a great idea 
of what this airplane is. Once we get our lights back on and all of that stuff. Yes. Cool. Let's talk about the model itself, talk about the airplane, and talk about the last 747. The Boeing 747, it is an aircraft that needs absolutely no introduction. It is the Super Jumbo. It was the first of the Super Jumbo phenotype, if you will, that ever existed, and it is by far the most widely produced, and I would personally define it as the most successful jumbo jet ever. Produced from 1968 to 2023. Yes, we can finally say that the production run of the 747 is over. 1,574 of the type of all variants eventually were built, including this one, the very last one, line number 1574, hence 1,574 of the type being built in total. The aircraft, as the Dash 100 variant, the first variant of the series, made its first flight on February 9, 1969, and it entered into service with Pan Am on January 22, 1970. The 747 has been flying for so long that its first flight occurred before the first manned lunar landing. That's how long the 747 has been gracing our skies. And thankfully, we are most likely at least 20 years away from being able to say when the last flight of a 747 will be. Although, it is quite possible that we could have at least a handful of these airplanes, including this particular one, flying for even longer than two decades or so in the future. Such can be the service life of an airframe, particularly when they are maintained properly. However, the Dash 8 variant, the largest, newest, and now final variant of the 747, that one has been around for a little bit shorter and duration. However, it will remain in service for a very long time to come, I am absolutely sure. The Dash 8 in the 8F configuration, the same configuration variant that you see here, made its first flight on February 8, 2010, and it was followed up by its airliner version, the 8I, on March 20, 2011. So the 8F came into service first of the Dash 8 variants. It made its service debut, the 8F anyway, on October 12, 2011 with Cargo Lux, and June 1, 2012, the 8I followed with Lufthansa. The 8F and the 8I, both in service today, and the largest operators of the types, both types actually, are UPS Airlines, that's the United Parcel Service, Lufthansa, Korean Air, and Cathay Pacific Cargo. Atlas Air, obviously, also a major operator of the Dash 8, particularly in the 8F variant. 155 Dash 8s in both configurations have been produced, and with this particular aircraft, the last one to be produced, there will be no more. It, of course, was developed from the 747-400, which was the variant that immediately preceded the Dash 8, and there are no more developments that are currently forecast to be derived from the Dash 8, although work on what will be the VC-25B, the two U.S. presidential aircrafts that uh, are still slated to come into service to replace the aging VC-25s or VC-25As, that work is still ongoing, but those airframes have already been produced and they are still currently in the state of being converted for their particular missions. Overall specifications here on the 8F as we see it here. We're talking about a modern civil jet. Obviously, the main scheme here, we have got a low wing that is mounted low on the fuselage with the wing spar, so no high wing specialized cargo transport aircraft here. So it's not quite like a C-5 or like an Antonov 124, for example. But we do have a few interesting features on the 8F variant that do kind of put it in similar company to those larger, very specialized military aircraft. Namely, we do have an openable nose cone on the 8F, and that allows the nose to swing open so that you can directly load outsized cargo into the fuselage down the center line. That's pretty cool. The 8F also has the ability to lower its landing gear struts in terms of reduce the height of the nose wheels a bit so that you can facilitate that nose ramp loading operation. Of course, we also do have numerous side doors, both for entering and exit of personnel, but also we have got some cargo doors on the 8F fuselage that are different from what you would normally see on the civilian airliner variants, the 8i. However, 
this high technology involving the latest avionics suites, the most fuel efficient engines that have ever been put on a 747, it requires a cockpit crew of just two. You have got, obviously, a captain and first officer, two pilots in the cockpit, though, and obviously for longer missions you would have relief crews there, and they would be living on the upper deck of the aircraft, which, unlike the 8i variant, the upper deck on the 8F is much shorter. This one is actually more comparable in terms of overall proportion to what you might have seen on the Dash 200 variant of the 747. Not to say that they are the same dimensions, but proportionally, overall, fuselage length relative to the upper deck length, it kind of is visually evocative of what you would have seen on the Dash 200 747s. However, that cockpit crew of two, what are they in charge of? Well, first of all, they have got a fuselage volume that can accommodate 46 96 by 125 inch pallets in the main cargo deck. There's obviously a lower deck as well for some avionics equipment and whatnot. However, because this airplane is not designed for passenger service, the exit limit in terms of human beings that need to be able to get out of this airplane in a hurry, the 8i has an exit limit of 605 people, the 8f has an exit limit of 8. So you definitely see the implications of the highly specialized missions that this particular airplane has been designed for. Cargo volume though, 30,832 cubic feet, or 873.7 cubic meters. Absolutely enormous internal volume on an aircraft like this, and of course it is well accommodating to all manner of things that might find their way into that cargo bay. Overall length on the aircraft is 250 feet 2 inches, or 76.25 meters. Overall height from the bottom of the main gear to the top of the empennage is 63 feet 6 inches, or 19.35 meters. Overall wingspan is 224 feet 7 inches or 68.45 meters. The wing area is 5,960 square feet or 554 square meters. The wings are swept back at 37.5 degrees and they have an aspect ratio of 8.45. You can also see just visually here on the model, and obviously this is evident in real scale on the real aircraft, how thin those wings are, particularly as you start to move out toward the wing tips. You do not see, however, any conspicuous end fences on these wings. You don't see any shark fins, sharklets, scimitars, whatever you want to call them. You do not see end fences on these 8F or 8I wings. The 8F and the 8I share a wing, obviously. That is because they've been able to make these wings so efficient by thinning out their cross-sectional profile as you get closer to the wingtips. It cuts out on unnecessary drag that is normally the domain of the wingtip devices that we have mentioned. Overall cabin width on the aircraft is 20 feet exactly, or 6.1 meters. And here we go in terms of the superlative generators. Maximum takeoff weight on both the 8F and the 8I 987,000 pounds, that's 448 tons. The operating empty weight differs a little bit between the 8F and the 8I. On the 8F, it is 434,600 pounds, or 197.1 tons. That is with your operating fuel load, but absent any cargo. Maximum payload, this is not accounting for fuel weight, just in pure payload, 292,400 pounds or 132.6 tons. Fuel capacity, therefore, 59,734 U.S. gallons, that's 226,120 liters, or in imperial gallons, if you wish, 49,739. So that's an awful lot of gas to get an awful lot of mass airborne. Maximum cruise speed on the 8F is Mach 0.845, that's 485 knots, 898 kilometers per hour, or 558 miles per hour. Your maximum speed, though, your maximum Mach number is going to be Mach 0.9, that's 516 knots, 956 kilometers per hour, or 594 miles per hour. Maximum range on the 8F. 4,265 nautical miles, that's 7,899 kilometers, or 4,908 miles. Service ceiling, 43,100 feet, that's 13,100 meters. Installed power, we have four 
GE NX Next Generation 2B67 turbofan engines. They produce 66,500 pounds or 296 kilonewtons of thrust each at sea level. And of course, the airplane does have an auxiliary power unit as well, which is a gas turbine engine courtesy of Pratt & Whitney. Specification on that in particular is the PW901A through C series of gas turbine engine for the auxiliary power unit here on both the 8i and the 8f. So really impressive specifications for a really impressive airplane and to say that the 747 era has come to a close at very least in terms of production, it's a poignant moment for sure. In terms of information about this particular airframe specifically, well, we really don't have all that much to go by because the airplane is so incredibly new. It first flew on December 18th, 2022, and it was delivered to Atlas Air shortly thereafter. In fact, there was a big ceremony that involved the official unveiling and delivery of this airplane, and I believe that happened in January of 2023. With it still being 2023, well, the airplane is less than one year old, and it's well less than one year in active service, and, well, it is an active service cargo plane. In fact, as of the time of recording this, the airplane's most recent excursion was between Quito, Ecuador, and Miami, Florida. So it is in active service, doing its job, flying cargo all over the world for Atlas Air to their assorted customers everywhere. So it's an active service airplane. If you're a plane spotter, there is a good chance that you're going to see this one eventually. So yes, she's out there. She's going to be doing her thing for probably at least 20 years to come. And definitely take a look up because you might just happen to see the very last 747 gracing the skies right above your head. What a sight that might be. However, she won't necessarily look quite like this. Obviously, the airplane would not be pressed into commercial service looking like this. Evidently, you can see the anti-corrosion undercoat applied to pretty much the entire fuselage. And in addition, you can also see some areas of what I believe would be Kevlar for particular structural reinforcement in critical areas you can see around the wing spar as well as near the hinge point where the rudder is going to be, or where the rudder actually is in the horizontal, in the vertical stabilizer rather. But uh, yes, Obviously, she's flying in a proper Atlas Air livery today, but the subject matter of this model captures not only this particular airplane being the distinguished one that it is, but it, but it captures this particular airplane in a particular moment of its history. Basically, the day that it rolled off the assembly line, when it was born, if you will, and really when she made her first flight, I think she also would have looked like this, it's capturing a specific airplane, a very special airplane, at a very particular and special moment in its life. And there it is. Very unique in terms of the subject matter for a model, particularly in my collection. This is the first time that I've got a model of an airplane that's aiming to capture it in a specific moment, not even necessarily in a particular era of its life, in a particular airline's livery, for example, but it's capturing the aircraft in the moment that it came to be. And that's particularly cool and to me I think very admirable that NG decided to take on this project and produce these because you might think that just having a model that's done in an undercoat, the anti-corrosion coatings as you can see there, the green that you see predominantly on the airplane, you might think that that would be pretty easy. It's not. And it's really not, because if you take a look here on the starboard side of the airplane, and we'll take a closer look at this later on, you can see that we have got the two banners there, the Atlas Air logo, as well as the tribute to the 747 production team. That's all been replicated in 1-400 scale, and it's legible, and I'm going to show it to you in due course. That took a lot of care on the part of NG to be able to pull that off, and pull it off they have done. So despite the airplane looking a bit strange in terms of it doesn't have a proper livery on it yet, it still has been done with the same care and pride that NG have put into all of their models of late. And it's yet another reason why I'm finding this one in particular to be so impressive. This model is also the first NG that I have that is not a 747SP or an L1011 or a 737-800. We've taken a look at several examples of those over the years. 
So really, this is a little bit of new territory for me as well. This is my first time seeing NG put together an airplane as large as this and as intricate as this one is in terms of the specific details in the paint work and the tampo printing work. And they've really done a fantastic job all around. I've got to say it is absolutely brilliant and I am absolutely thrilled to have it in the collection because it is so unique, because it is capturing a very special airplane at a very special moment in its life. Let's take a very close look at some of those finer details closer in. First off, taking a look here from the starboard side of the aircraft, and this is where most of our livery, if you want to call it that, features are going to be evident. First of all, you can see that we have got a wonderful final coat of I guess top coat, clear coat that you might see on this thing. You can tell that we have got a highly reflective, highly polished overall paint surface here via the reflections of the lights in the top portion of the fuselage, but also the application of the color looks absolutely great. It's uniform. I have not spotted any paint flaws whatsoever, nor have I spotted any flaws in terms of application of tampo printed detail. So this is very nicely done. First of all, you may notice here on the nose section, we've got something a bit unique. You've got the ray dome in its normal place, but it is unpainted. It is a different material than the rest of the overall aluminum fuselage, so the ray dome is going to be a composite material. It's going to look different, and in this unpainted state, its natural color appears to be a white off-white color, so you can see the unpainted ray dome there. Additionally, you can see the shut lines here for the openable nose section, because of course this is an 8F and we have got a nose cargo hatch. Very cool. So you've got the shut lines for the cargo hatch, the little ears, the triangular sail panels, if you want to call them that, for the upper portion, the corners there of the hatch so that they seal up properly below the cockpit. And then, of course, you've got the cockpit windows themselves. You have got an upper door for access to the cockpit directly, and then you have got your three windows here for the upper deck, the only real seating area on the 8F, as it were. That upper deck is going to have a small seating area. It's going to have a galley. It's going to have bunks for crew rest for longer flights when they need a crew rotation. So we've got ourselves quite a bit of detail just here in the forward section of the aircraft. Also, we have got a standard type cargo door down below. And that's something that you'll also see on the 8I variants of the 747-8. But beyond that, you don't see any windows. You don't see any passenger cabin windows. You don't see any of your R1, R2, R3 doors that you would see in the 8i variant because this is not an airliner. It was not built as an 8i and then converted to a freighter. It is the 8F. It will never carry passengers in revenue service. So that's where all of those details have gone. Conspicuously here, though, we do have some detailing that you won't see on any other airplane. You have got this first banner here on the side, and it says the same things that were said on the box, Atlas Air 747-8. It has got, let's see, proudly building the 14th, and then I can't read it anymore, but I'll splice in high-resolution picture that I've taken here with a macro lens so you can see what that actually says. It is 100% legible, and it's not been distorted in any appreciable way. You can even make out the fact that they have got a Boeing logo in the upper left of that banner. So, absolutely admirable job on the part of MG. As we start to pan aft, you can see some more typical details that you would find on a Dash 8. We have got our wing spar. We have got our leading edge slats there, obviously in their retracted positions, but you can see the shut lines where they will come out from the wing structure. And we've also got the fairings for our landing lights. Additionally, we have our engine nacelles with the chevron patterns on the after trailing edges. That is for turbulence reduction and therefore noise reduction. It also helps with evacuating that exhaust air from the engine, so it helps fuel efficiency as well. And then, of course, we have got the hot side of the engine here in the center with the exhaust cone. And that also is, uh, well, that's where all the fuel is burning up. The nacelle, that whole fairing around the core of the engine is really just a big propeller. Bypass is a big deal in modern turbofan engine design. Lots of thrust just from funneling air around the hot core of the engine. But I digress. Additionally, around the area of the wing spar, you can see that this yellow rectangular section is here. I believe that's trying to show a Kevlar panel. That's just for a little bit of structural rigidity reinforcement. 
And then back here, we have got another banner that have, uh, that NG have reproduced here. This one is a little bit harder to see from our particular angle. It's also a little bit harder to read, but again, another high resolution picture being spliced in here so you can see what this actually says. It has a picture of the Dash 8 Boeing 747. It's got the Boeing logo in the upper left. And then it has got the line number, the last 747 evident in there. Very, very cool. The last graphic here is actually the aircraft's registration. This one is very plainly visible here. November 863 Golf Tango, the registration of the last 747. There it is. And you can see how it's just been cut and pasted there almost as an afterthought. Obviously the airplane would have flown in this visual configuration and you need by law to have your registration plainly evident someplace on the fuselage. And well, that's where Boeing have stuck it and that's where it is and NG dutifully have reproduced it in all of its inelegance. But very, very cool. Empennage also looking a bit strange with vaguely some Atlas Air reminiscent colors there, but also some of the anti-corrosion paint visible there on the leading edge of the vertical stabilizer, also evident on the horizontal stabilizers. Can't quite see the upper or lower faces of them, but we have got uh, the same colors on the horizontal stabilizers as well, absent the blue, however, so just green and yellow there. And then you can also see the uh, area where the horizontal stab can trim. So this can deflect down and up relative to what the pilots are demanding from the trim system. Also the autopilot's gonna be operating that way. So here from the starboard side, some really cool details and plenty of things that you won't see on a fully finished 747. Taking a look here at 8F from an aft view, and really there's nothing at all to remark about here livery-wise. It's all featureless green from this angle. The only particular detail that you can see here, and NG have done a very nice job with this, the exhaust for the auxiliary power unit right there, that uh, circular area in the center there in the tail cone. That is where the auxiliary power unit, the gas turbine, Pratt & Whitney engine is exhausting, and that's gonna be generating electrical power and hydraulic pressure for the airplane when you're on the ground on the stand with your engines, your main engines shut down. So a very important piece of infrastructure for the airplane, NG going through the trouble of actually creating a separately applied element there to emulate the exhaust port on the APU. Very cool. Also below that, it's uh, not entirely obvious of what it is, but there have been a few crenulations added in this section just to try and emulate what the uh, the anti-collision light looks like. That's the word I'm looking for. It's a strobe light at the very aft of the airplane and it's in a fairing just below the APU exhaust. You don't have the bezel or anything else reproduced, but you do have the area where the light should be. So its placement is sort of implied and it works quite nicely. Moving outboard to either side though, there is the trailing edge profile of the wings and they look absolutely wonderful, I must say. You can see here the uh, engines, we can actually see through them. You can see here particularly here on the inboard engine from this perspective, you can see light passing through the fan blades there through the bypass section of the engine, which means that NG have actually gone through and replicated at very least the macrocosmic placement of the main elements of the engine, at least things that you'd be able to see in gross terms, and they've done it in such a way that it uh, preserves some of the optical qualities of what you would actually see if you're going to look through the back of a jet engine in reality. So that is absolutely cool. You can also see the wonderful profile of that wing in general. You, first of all, you can see how thin it is, relatively speaking. That's so cool. But uh, additionally, you can see that it's not entirely straight across. You have got this wonderful sort of upward curve toward the wingtip, as you would see in reality. That is absolutely fantastic. Beyond that, you can see the fairings below the wing. Those are covering up the actuation armature for the flaps. And you can see there, these little canoes, sometimes people call them, but uh, I just call them fairings because that's what they are. They're there to cut down on wake turbulence, really, that would be induced by the hinges and other actuation uh, equipment there required for the flaps. Obviously, similar details going to be evident here on the starboard wing, the engines visible there, as well as the wonderful 
trailing edge profile of the wing. And again, that uh, back sweep of 37 and a half degrees, very evident here as well. Very, very nice. Along center line, you can see the main landing gear. We have got the four trucks thereof, plainly evident. The wheels on the model, they do rotate. However, the, the gear struts and the bogies, they do not articulate in any way. And a lot of Gemini Jets models, you'll have the bogies that will actually articulate fore to aft. Uh, NG models historically have not had that feature, but they do have rolling wheels and rubber tires. So very, very nice. And also you can see by taking a look at how the airplane's looking here, sitting on the ground, all the landing gear are of the proper lengths and the airplane does sit straight and level on the ground, at least in the roll axis. The pitch axis is something that we'll talk about a little bit. However, from what we see here from an aft view, looks absolutely resplendent. Looking at the last 747 here from the port side, actually there's a little bit less to see on the port side than there is on the starboard side because we don't have any of those banners evident here. However, we do have a feature that was absent on the starboard side. We have what is, I guess, technically you could call it an L1 door and it is the only crew loading door, if you will. It's the only door that is meant for regular human habitation or human use on the whole airplane. Everything else is dedicated to cargo. You do still have a similar detail there of the ray dome here from the port side, unpainted cockpit windows from the port side. You can also just see a little bit of a hint of the emergency escape hatch in the cockpit roof right there that the uh, crew could climb out of the airplane via escape rope if they really must but that's evident there. Three windows on the upper deck, that looks good. We've got dorsal antennas visible here as well, which also you could see from the other side, but I didn't point them out. Additionally, you've got a ventral antenna below. Very, very nice. You've got that uh, L1 door, looks good. Details on it look uh, marvelous, really. No distortion, nothing out of the ordinary. Also, we have got some static ports and air data ports here along the nose, just aft of the cargo door. So, pitot tubes right there, very nice. And then, of course, basically a recapitulation of the details that we did see on the starboard side, minus the banners. Very cool. Nice uh, landing light fairing details. Nice leading edge slat detail. Engine nacelles look absolutely marvelous. They also have the uh, ground start override panel right there. That's cool. Leading edge profile of the wing. Wing tip looks absolutely marvelous. Here's something different though, we have got an aft cargo door right here, something that you won't see on an 8i and you won't see on the starboard side of this aircraft. Big cargo door, so for things that you don't want to put in through the nose, you can put them here through aft midships through the uh, port side fuselage. Very, very nice. And then of course we've got our registration once more, November 863 Golf Tango. Vertical stabilizer looks identical from both port and starboard sides, as you can see, as do the horizontal stabilizers, but still we have not quite been able to get a proper look at them. I do want to point out, though, you can see the nose wheel right here. Nothing wrong with it. It's the right height and everything else. However, it is ever so slightly not on the ground. I do this, now it is, now it's not, now it is, now it's not, now it is. You get the picture. The airplane is ever so slightly weight biased rearward. So we got to get our loadmaster in here and just move something a couple centimeters forward. However, it does not quite sit straight and level on the ground in the pitch axis. So something to note. I am sure that it really doesn't matter because I pull out just a little bit and you can't even see that anymore. However, it is there and it is something that deserves to be noted, but just having the airplane sit here from a reasonable distance, you're not going to notice that and it looks absolutely fine and I can't even really take a point off for that. It's just something that it does and I've got numerous models that have similar little quirks either in roll or in pitch in terms of how they sit on the ground on their own gear. But it is a thing, and we've noted it. And now a nose on view of the last 747. Looking great. You can now see that ray dome unpainted in its gloriousness, and you can see the overall proportion of the main gear and the nose gear together in frame. It looks good. 
even though the nose is slightly off the ground, I again can't really tell the difference. I don't really care about it. But some wonderful things to see here. You can see the nose detail, cockpit windows. We've got windscreen wipers visible, that emergency escape hatch visible. We have got, uh, I believe they would be uh, little misters for de-icing fluid. Very nice, plainly evident, looks good. Fairings for the landing lights and the wing struts. You can see that looks good. And then we have got our engines on the intake side. You can see the intake fans here on the engines and get a little bit of light in there. Perhaps you'll be able to see a little bit more detail. No promises because obviously the overhead lights here are very bright. So the contrast probably won't be there, but we have got fan blades very nicely replicated. They are static, they do not rotate. This is not a 1-200 scale model, but uh, for what they are, everything looks great. It's crisp, everything is proportional in terms of size. The blades look good, the angles look good, the space in between them looks good. And of course, you can see through the engines, and right here, plainly evident here on the port wing, you can see light through the engine structure. So looks good, the sizes and shapes of everything looks good. And honestly, this is one fantastic model airplane. Definitely one of the better ones that I have got so far, and I am really, really pleased about everything that you see here. Looks so, so marvelous, and again, it is just a very unique piece for a very unique airplane. Taking the camera freehand now for a look at some details that perhaps we didn't get the best look at prior. First of all, here from the port side, you can see wonderful detailing there along the nose. You can see the shut line for the cargo hatch, the nose cargo hatch, the windscreen wipers, the misters for the de-icing fluid, and of course the cockpit windows themselves. Very nice tampo printed details, all of that. There's your nose landing gear, and we are just touching the ground there with the right wheel. Very interesting there, but again, it just barely works. That's cool. There is your L1 door, basically the only door of any sort that the crew would be using. Very nice. Three windows there for the upper deck, and then as we start to move aft midships, there is the antenna detail. Some of them are physically there as three-dimensional features. Some of them are just tempo printed on. Regardless, they all look good. Anti-collision lights there. Communications and radio antennas there. Upper surfaces of the wings. Looks good. Looks as you would expect. Absolutely love that shape, though. Looking great. Engine nacelles with the little fins on the inboard sides. All four of them have that, as they should. Looks good. De-icing ring on the intake side of the engine. All four of them look good. And then moving aft, there's your cargo door in the fuselage. And then we've got ourselves the registration. November 863 Golf Tango. And then the top side of the empennage there. You can see the blue on the vertical stabilizer. However, the blue is absent on the horizontal stabilizers. But the green and the yellow remain. Looks great. And really, the overall presence of this piece is so very good, and it, it looks the part. And honestly, if I were to have a proper background here, and not just pure white on white, you might think you're looking at the real airplane if I were to be a little bit creative with my photography techniques. But I cannot complain about anything that you see here. And lastly, to show you everything here from the starboard side, this is where all the action is on this particular model. Again, the nose section looks good. There's a cargo door for the lower deck. And then, of course, some more static ports and pitot tubes there that we didn't point out earlier, but they're also here on the starboard side. Cockpit area, upper deck, and there we go with our banner here. Yeah, you can get in close enough. You can see that as it is. Very, very nice. You can pause the video here if you want to take a second look at this. Looks good. And then moving aft to the second banner. This one is a little bit more intricate in terms of what the tampo printing has to accomplish, so it might be a little bit more difficult to make out some of the smaller characters, but you can plainly see what it is, and it uh, looks good. Obviously a picture of the 747 in flight. Got some puffy clouds below. And then our text looks good. There's your registration once again. Aftmost antenna just in front of the vertical stabilizer. And then the area where the uh, 
horizontal stabilizer can deflect for trim. And then the top with your shut lines there evident for the elevators as well as your undercoatings visible. Looks real, real good. Really pleased overall with this model. I cannot fault it really for anything. I don't care that it doesn't quite sit down perfectly on the nose gear. Doesn't matter really in the least to me. This is such a special, unique airplane, and really it's a very unique model because, again, it is not just trying to emulate the aircraft as it is, the tail number that it is, the serial number that it is, but it's trying to show it at a particular moment of its life, which is really, really cool to me. So there it was, rendered in resplendent 1400 scale by NG Next Generation Models, the Boeing 747-8F, the very last 747 that ever shall be. It is, as I said, a poignant moment to note that the era of 747 production has truly come to an end with this airframe. However, the era of the jumbo, the era of the 747, is far from over. Airplanes nowadays have lifespans in active service upwards of 20 years. This one has not even flown for one year yet. So, barring the unthinkable, this airplane most likely will be with us for quite some time to come. And hopefully, in another 20 years or so, I'll be able to come back and perhaps publish a follow-up video in eight-dimensional space or whatever it is at that point in terms of video technology and commemorate the end of the 747 era with hopefully this airplane making its final landing and being consigned to an aviation museum someplace where it will be appreciated by generations more people to come. However, that day, as poignant as it will be, is so far away from us at this point that it barely bears mention. The 747 8F by NG in 1400 scale, it is a wonderful commemoration of the final 747 to cross out of the production line and to enter active service. And again, as I have said so many times already, it's commemorating not only the last 747, but it's commemorating the last 747 when it first broke cover out of the production hangars at Boeing and was shown to the world for the first time. It doesn't look like this any longer. It probably never will look like this again, no matter if Atlas Air hold it for its entire service life or if eventually it is sold off to another operator. It never will appear like this ever again with the undercoats visible, with the banners for Atlas Air painted on the side. It is a one of one in terms of when the airplane looked like this, and of course, because it is a very special aircraft in a very special moment, it was the perfect subject matter for NG to commemorate, and commemorate it they sure have. The quality on this one, it is in keeping with the general standards that we have been seeing over the years from NG. They are 747 SP models that I have shown several times previously on the channel, very similar in terms of the overall fit and finish. It's heavy, it is built well, nothing is loose, the landing gear is good despite it not quite sitting straight and level there on the nose gear, but you've got rotating wheels, rubber tires, nothing is loose, the empennage is in place securely, the main wings are in place securely, nothing comes out when you want to handle the airplane, so it does everything that it advertises, and it even has a stand hole, as you can see here, so you can display it in a position more akin to what it might look like in flight. So, really, it's a fantastic piece, it's weighty, it's constructed well, the paint and printing on it are flawless, as you have seen. Could not recommend this one any more highly. Do take a look for this one if you are in the market for one 400 scale diecast aircraft because this, as is the case with a great many others of these, it's a limited production run and once it's gone, it's probably going to be gone for good. So if you do want this one, and I do recommend that you do take a very strong look at this one being the last 747, particularly looking as unique as this particular one does, Definitely consider it for your model aircraft collection because it's a special one and there will never be another one quite like it. Be that as it may, though, I do hope that you have enjoyed this one, Ferrari Man 601, saying thank you very, very much for watching, and of course, we will see you soon.